Amen. You ready for the word? Amen. God's inner healing. This morning I want to talk about God's inner healing and God's healing the broken. William, I, I threw a picture there. I hope it came up on your thing. Do you have the picture of the redwood? There we go. If you go to the redwood forest in California, they have these massive, massive trees that are, have been around for hundreds upon hundreds of years. In fact, um, this tree would probably, if you can read the fine print, would say that that very center probably started growing in the possibility of 509 A.D., that's how long these trees have been in existence. And in these trees and in these rings, every ring around that tree represents a year of that tree's life. The closer the rings are together, the tighter the rings indicate years that that tree made it through harsh conditions, harsh situations, harsh weather, whether it was, whether it was storms or lightning or, or, or fire or bug, those different years. And then the years where the rings are wider talks about or, or is indicative of years that there were good growing conditions for the tree. If you look, a lot of the tree's rings, if you were to really look close and examine, you'll find that a lot of those years existed through harsh conditions. But inside these massive, beautiful um, trees that just span so upward to the sky, these massive giants, there are behind, underneath their glory and their majesty is a history a history of the years of the bug infestation and a history of the lightning and a history of the drought and a history of the too much rain or a history of the mudslide that these trees withstood. And likewise, in each of our lives, we come and we get together with each other and we see one another and, and we see our outer person, we see our outer image, how we present each, ourselves to one another. And it can often look majestic or glorious. You know, we always try to put on that best face or that best appearance. But often underneath the surfaces of our life are years that have withstood the hard years. Years that have withstood the abuse or the, the relationship breakup or the, or the addiction or the different struggle that might have happened during those years of our lives. And those, those years don't leave us unscarred. Those years don't leave us without an effect underneath the surface, without having affected how we deal with one another and each other in our life. And people have and carry with them years from abuse as child, as children. Many have been through abusive situations as kids. Many have been through sexual mistreatment by a relative or family member. Others have experienced hurtful actions or emotional wounds from parents in our lives. And we keep on living and we keep on putting on the good faces and we keep on putting on the smiles and the sweetness. But really underneath the surface there's something very deep that lurks within the funny thing is when we get into relationships with other people, that's when those issues tend to come out. That's why marriages suffer difficulties and families have dysfunctionality inside of them because it's relationship with other people that bring out the negative of relationship that we've had in our earlier years of life, those scars beneath the surface of our lives. And often we find ourselves trying to heal ourselves through through medications and self-medicating in different ways or finding different things to cover up the pain in our lives because we carry emotional wounds from life. I don't think there's probably anybody in this room that's not been through any type of emotional pain whatsoever in your life. We've all been there. Whether it was a harsh word. I remember, I remember when I was a kid, I, I can still remember this, this scene, and, and it wasn't really that big of a deal, but it, it, it stuck with me for a lot of years. I remember being in the backseat of the car, and one of my friends from another church about an hour away, my parents had gone to visit them, and, and this kid had a really nice singing voice. He would sing, their church was a really big church, and they had those big Christmas choir cantatas, and, and at eight years of age, he would sing, canta he would sing solos for the church, and, and both of our dads, my dad had an, had an amazing singing voice, and my mom and his parents had great singing voices. And stuff. And I remember I was singing in the back of the car, you know, I'll just kind of sing as we go along. And I remember my dad saying I couldn't carry a tune in a bucket. I gotta be honest with you, that hurt. I felt so, and I don't think it was intentional to be mean or to be harsh, but that marked my thought of my voice and how I sang or or what I did for a lot of years. I still, I, so my, my wife can recall a story too where, where just a word was said by a parent that was not really intended to be harsh or mean and stuff, but yeah, it, 
would stick with. And then there are kids who sometimes have that year where, you know, the parents thought it would be cute to give you charcoal in your stocking in front of, instead of a gift for Christmas time. And the depth of wound that that would create and greater abuses even beyond that. But it affects how we begin perceiving life, how we begin to interact with other people in life, and how we approach life in general. And then we hear about this Jesus, this wonderful Jesus who came and died for our sins, this wonderful Jesus who has healing for us, this wonderful Jesus who can, who's the answer to all of our issues in life. And we come and we ask Jesus into our hearts and we immediately feel forgiveness of our sins and we immediately feel those burdens roll off of our back because Christ has come into our lives. But for some reason we're still contending with the emotional pain that we've carried for so many years. Whether that was from a marriage that was broken or, or a sibling that mistreated. We still carry those pains and we go, why? Why doesn't that end? Why doesn't it stop? Where's Christ in the middle of all that? And why am I still going through that pain? And it's because Jesus is the answer. He still truly is the solution. We can't just say that people who have, who have emotional or even where it's developed into mental issues, we can't just cast them all off as being demon-possessed or having problems like that or, or just say, just go read your Bible and pray and it'll take care of it. It's a process of taking the Word of God and applying it into our life, who Christ is and what He did for us, but there's a process that we have to go through in our lives to find the healing that He really has. Sometimes there's some instantaneous healing that Christ brings into our lives, and sometimes it's a process as we grow in Christ and find his character, because how many know that the character of Christ is perfect? The character of people is not. And as people, we continue to hurt one another often in life because we are hurt people. And we have to begin looking no longer through the glasses that see the hurt and the pain and the wrong perceptions, but we have to begin seeing ourselves and others through the perspective that Christ wants us to see them through. And that's a process. It doesn't just happen like that. In the meantime, we try to take care of that. We think that a glass of wine will relax us. We think that a sexual encounter will bring us a sense of love that maybe we didn't feel from a parent. We think that maybe, you know, we self-medicate with many different things. Sometimes it's prescriptions. Sometimes it's street drug. Sometimes it's homeopathic or natural. And, you know, I understand the use of Drugs in a proper sense. I understand the the use of aromatherapy to bring down our our emotions or different things. But you know what? None of those heals. Those things can't heal. That glass of wine, that lavender oil, that, 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 that sexual addiction with somebody else, they're not going to heal the pain. They're going to cover it. Or they're going to soothe it for a temporary piece of time. Because they treat a symptom. But what God wants us to do is come and find that the true answer really is in Christ. The true answer really is in the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, verses 26 to 27 says, And the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father who knows all hearts knows what the Spirit is saying, for the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will. In other words, God knows exactly where you are. He knows the exact pain that you carry in your life. He knows the exact abuse or circumstance or situation that brought damage into your life that you have not allowed God to bring you out from. And the Holy Spirit wants to help you in that weakness. You can try and treat it symptomatically with all the things that are around us in the world, but it's allowing the Spirit of God to get into the depth of your being and bring you from the pain through it to the other side of the pain to where you are a healed person in Christ. And for the next several weeks, I'm going to embark on a series as we come through the end of this year about God's inner healing and about God's wanting to heal the pain and about the very different ways that we present emotional damage in our life so we can find the different things that we identify with and how God wants to work to bring those healings into those weaknesses because they are truly weakness. And that's the first thing I want to talk about this morning. What is infirmity or what is weakness? 
You know, Paul used the word that the Holy Spirit wants to help us in our weakness. We know that Jesus died for our infirmities. When he took his stripes upon his back, they were for the infirmities in our bodies. And we so often look at that word weakness or infirmity, and we, and we simply look at that in a physical realm. And the physical sickness we have, or we look at it in the sinful place. But the word there is asthenia. It's, that's the Greek word that's there. And it means the inability to produce results. This weakness. But what this weakness or this infirmity is, is that somewhere between sin, and we all know sin's affected the entire world, right? We've all sinned, correct? And we've all sinned against other people. And other people have sinned against us. And there's some place between sin and physical sickness that exists in the life of every person. And that's the emotional part of our being. God made us more than just physical and spiritual. He made us body, soul, and spirit. There's an emotional part of who we are and how God has created us to be. Those emotions that God has given us. There's not sin in emotion. There's not sin in joy or sin in so sorrow. There's not sin even in anger. It's what we do with those emotions when we have experienced them or they've come to us. But there's a place between sin and physical sickness in our emotional being in every human being that lives. That is this place that this word and this Greek word asthenia is speaking about that we refer to as weakness. Because in reality the weakness of our emotions affects our going out and committing sin. And the weakness of our emotions also affects very often our physical man. You know, many people who struggle with, 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 with stomach issues or with, with, with um, stress issues or heart issues or different things, those things are beginning in the emotion and carrying out in the physical man. Even back problems and pain physically in our bodies and our joints and other things, they often start in the very depth of our emotion and then carry out into our physicality. And what we need to do is not look, we can try and treat that with drugs. We can try and treat it with things in this earth. But what God wants to treat it with is his healing. By his stripes, we are healed, the word tells us. And God wants to heal those parts of our bodies through his blood. He took the stripes, he shed the blood to pay for those things. Luke 4, 18, Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. To heal the brokenhearted. That means for every wound in your emotion, every damage to your emotions, Jesus came to bring healing to that. To proclaim liberty to the captives because so often when our emotions are damaged, we then enter into choices in our lifestyles. We enter into choices in our behaviors as human beings. Choices that become more destructive in our lives. Right now, our society fights so hard to accept so many of the lifestyle choices that people are making, especially in the LGBTQ community, which are not rooted in how God created them, but they're rooted in the fact that sin has come into this world. Sin causes people to damage one another, and then we react to those things based out of those sinful things because of the damaged and destroyed emotions in our lives. And what's there are people who need to be healed up. Not judged and condemned by the church, but people who need to be healed because they've been wounded by things. They've been injured by things. They've been abused by parents, abused by aunts and uncles, or abused by other people in their life. They've been through, whether that was emotional or sexual or whatever it might be. But we can choose other things. It's the same way with a person who is extremely promiscuous and is out sleeping around all the time. It's because of damage in their emotional life. The person who turns to drugs and alcohol, it's because of the damage of some wound in their life. All of these things are things that we turn to. We turn to sinful behavior to try and, 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 and soothe our spirits. But all we do is create greater destruction when we do that. But Jesus said, that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. And our world, the more I look at it, the less Christianity that exists in our world, the less people turn to God, the less people are going to the Word of God and to the Bible, the more Christians ignore the Word of God in their own life and just go to church only on Sunday and never seek out Christ in the middle of the week, the more we see this, the more damage we see in people's lives and the more damage being done to one another. But Jesus wants to bring that healing, amen? Isaiah 53 verse 4 says, Yet it was our weaknesses 
those infirmities that he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. No, when Jesus took, he didn't just take our sins to the cross. He took our weaknesses. He took all the effect of sin in the world. He took the effect of other people's sin against us and the effect of our sin against others. He took all of that to the cross with him. Those things, that again, lead to that place of sickness in our lives. And he allowed himself to be beaten and bruised and broken and betrayed. He allowed he himself experienced the same betrayal, the same abuses, the same damage to his spirit man as we receive to ours so he could overcome, make right choices, not sin in response, go to the cross, pay the price, and resurrect from the dead with the power to bring that completion of healing into our lives. And God wants to heal each of us. He wants our spirit man to be healed. He wants our emotional man to be healed. He wants our physical man to be healed. Let's talk for a few minutes about the evidence of damaged emotions. Evidence of damaged emotions. I want to go over just a few areas, and we're going to hit these in depth over the next few weeks and what the Bible says about it and how the Bible says we can react to it and what we can do with it. But I wanted to just mention them this morning in an introduction sense to what we're going to talk, to, uh, talk about. One, and one way that damaged emotions presents themselves is when we have a deep sense of being unworthy. Anybody ever been there? That sense of inferiority, that sense of inadequacy, that sense of just not being good enough. That carries over when we have a sense of being unworthy, that carries over deeply into our relationship with God. Because how many know that God, when he comes to us to bring healing to our lives, it's not because we deserved it. It's not because we're worthy of his forgiveness. It's not because we're worthy uh, of his love or his caring. He comes to us in mercy and grace when we're unworthy. But sometimes if we have this sense, this deep sense of unworthiness, we're unwilling to accept his forgiveness. We're unwilling to accept his love because we lack trust because somewhere in our lives some authority figure betrayed us or was unaccepting of us and we got the sense that we're never good enough. And that can come greatly into affecting our walk with Jesus. It can hinder how we see Christ and how we perceive him and how we perceive the victory and the healing that he has for us. Another is the perfectionist complex. The perfectionist is that person that always has to do something else, always has to do something more. They never seem to think that they can make it just right. When they've climbed to the top of the ladder, they get to the very top, and all of a sudden three more rungs appear on the ladder, and they haven't reached the top, and they climb three more rungs, and they get there, and a couple more rungs appear again, and they have to jump higher and higher and higher. They have to go through another hoop and another hoop and another hoop, trying to get to that place where they're finished, where they're complete, where they can stop striving, but the sense of guilt to be better, the sense of guilt to attain, the sense of guilt to please overarches in their mind and in their ability to even accept who they are. And in their relationship with Christ, they're always thinking God wants to demand more and more and more of them. And, you know, it's interesting because God wants us to choose life of holiness. He wants us to choose a life of putting aside the things of this world. But if we're coming at our walk with Jesus because we have a perfectionist complex, we'll never come to that place of ever pleasing him. And we'll always feel a sense of guilt and like we failed God. We never come to a place of victory in Jesus. We're always stuck in defeat. And then there's that super sensitive person. You ever met that person? You all know who I'm talking about when I say the super sensitive person? It's the person when you walk by them in the hall and you smiled and said hello and they thought you were mad at them. They didn't stop and talk to me for a half an hour. They're mad at me. That super sensitive person, they, they've been hurt deeply in their life. They've experienced some of the deepest of hurts. That super sensitive person often will put on the most hardened exterior to their person because they are afraid to let anybody in. They don't want to let anybody in. And they will look, that's that person who sits there and looks like they're going to chew your head off if you go to say hi to them during meet and greet. And yet all they want is someone to come up and say hi to them. They've reached for love and approval and affection in their life just to experience rejection. 
just to be put down, just to be ignored. And so their edges become hard, and they become super sensitive to the people of God and even to the things of God in their lives. And then there are people who fear. Fear is a controlling thing in our lives. People who live in fear because they've suffered from a sense of failure. They've been told they're not good enough. They've been victims of abuse in their life as well. And they play it out by being afraid of everything. They're afraid to try anything. They're the people who never try out for a team or to be a part of a group because they're afraid that they'll fail in some way. They're never willing to step out and do something new. They're never willing to step out on the things of God or to even work for God or be a part of the kingdom and, and, and serving Jesus in some way because they're afraid that whatever they do, they're going to try and fail. They've been so abused in their life that they just, they're afraid of everything. They sit on the sideline of the game of life and they make up excuses. They don't like this game. They don't like the rules of the game. They don't like the referee in the game. But it's really all just a way to hide the fact that they are afraid to engage in the game. Because they would rather never try than to try and fail. They're afraid of God disciplining them. They're afraid of people disciplining them. They're afraid of disappointing others. They dream of escaping. And they often make the statement, if only it were like this. Because they can never see what is but what might be ideal. Some of you might be identifying with a few of these things. Then there's a person with a sexual problem. They've been so damaged in their lives that their only way to try and correct that damage is through sexual deviancy, sexual promiscuity, having improper relationship with their spouse, they, they struggle in their marriage, they struggle in the sexual side of their marriage, they might be cheating all the time, they might be struggling with, 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 with gender roles or, or, or improper view of the opposite sex or the same sex, but a lot of it's because they've carried a guilt and a shame and a condemnation because of someone who has sinned against them and victimized them in their life. And right now our society, like I said earlier, we're trying to make a great defense of sexual perversion and sexual deviancy, but what we're really not doing is finding the healing that people are looking for and needing. And I, I love it. There are, there, are, there are groups of people rising up that said it's not about being gay to straight, but it's about being lost to saved. It's about finding Christ and the healing that Jesus has in their lives for those wounds in their lives so they can get a proper perspective of how things are. Because sometimes when we've been damaged by somebody else in our lives, our perspective changes because of the fears and everything else that went along with that. And it's really just about bringing that correction to our lives, being healed of the original damage, rather than just trying to live life in a wrong choice of lifestyle according to God's word. All of these issues are things that represent people who have had their lives damaged in some way or another. Someone, people who are just feeling of great insignificance, but I still want you to know that Jesus really is the answer. He really is the answer, and I want to talk for a few moments just about the repair order this morning. How do we find healing? We first have to realize that God wants to do his part. We have to come to a reality that God wants to heal us. Amen? God desires to heal the very day. He came to heal the brokenhearted. Back to that first scripture, Romans 8, 26, and the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. The Spirit of God wants to not just, not just meet us on this side of our pain, but he wants to take us through our pain till the pain is no more on the other side. And he wants to be beside us. The Word of God calls the Spirit a counselor. It calls him a comforter. It calls him our advocate or our defender. Because he wants to walk with us in these areas of our pain and our life and bring us on the journey through to completion and healing in Christ. But we have to open up our lives. We can't reject him. You see, we have to do our part. The repair order is not just what God wants to do, but our willingness to let God do it. The Holy Spirit's a gentleman, the Word of God tells us. He will not force himself upon anybody. He will gently convict of sin, but then we have to respond by confessing that sin. He will, he will if he's moving in the church through, through his spirit, through the gifts, he will not force himself on anybody to be used, but wait for someone who's yielded to him to be used. He will not force himself on us to bring healing into our lives, but wait for us to say, yes, Spirit of God, I want you 
to move in my life and bring me healing. He will not exercise a lack of will on our part, but is waiting for our free will to choose to find obedience in Scripture, to find obedience to what does God's Word teach us so we may be healed, so we can encounter all that God has. The core of Christianity is forgiveness. Amen? Who's thankful for the forgiveness of Jesus? The core of Christianity is forgiveness, and the core of healing is forgiveness as well. I've said it for years as your pastor. You've heard me say it over and over and over again. Forgiveness, it's what it's all about. Unwillingness to forgive holds us in bondage to our emotional pain. So I'm going to mention six things that we have to do in the process of healing. Six things that we're going to go into more depth over the next several weeks. But I want to introduce them to you this morning. So if you're taking notes, write these down. The first is that you have to face the problem head on. You can never experience the healing God has for you unless you're willing to face the problem. Amen? You can't ignore it. You can't say it's not there. You have to ruthlessly and honestly allow the grace of God to be sufficient in your weakness. Paul wrote this in 2 Corinthians 12, 9. He said, each time he said, my grace is all you need. It is God's grace that you need more than the alcohol. It's grace that you need more than the drug, prescription, or street. It's grace that you need more than the sexual relationship. It's grace that you need more than the aromatherapy. It's grace that you need more than the food. It's grace that you need more from anything that we use as a crutch in this world. We need God's grace to be sufficient in our weakness. He says, my power works best in weakness. So now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. You see, Jesus wants to work as powerless, but we are going to have to enter into that road of needing his grace to be sufficient in our weakness. And we are going to have to face the problem head on and say, this exists. I have not dealt with this, and I want God, I want you to work with this in my life. I'm going to give it to you to start the journey. We often think that if we come and we just pray a quick prayer, boom, it's over. If we come and someone hurts us and say, I forgive you, that that's the end of it. You know, forgiveness doesn't It's not over in one phrase. When someone has deeply injured your life, you're not going to just say, I forgive you, and it's done. You're going to walk a path of forgiveness. That every time you feel the burn, every time you feel the pain, every time you feel the consequence because of what somebody did to you, where you're going to have to surrender that pain all over again to Jesus Christ. There are still some times that things that are a decade old, 15 years old in my life, that sometimes the pain will surge up and I have to choose to forgive that person all over again in my life. Because forgiveness is an ongoing choice to let it stand. God can forgive completely and perfectly the moment we ask him because he's God. But we're human, and it's a process for us. So we have to first face the problems head on. James 5.16 says to confess our sins to each other and pray for each other so that we may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. Many of us have not experienced the power of God's physical forgive or physical healing in our bodies because we're still holding on to what is, needs to be an emotional healing and we've not confessed. We've not confessed our sin of unforgiveness. We've not confessed our sin of our reaction to what someone else has done because in and above that, on your next thing that we have to do after we face that thing head on is we have to accept our responsibility. And you might be going, oh, pastor, what are you saying there? Accept my responsibility. It wasn't my fault that somebody raped me. It wasn't my fault that that my uncle sexually abused me. It wasn't my fault that my dad beat me in the head all the time. It wasn't my fault that these people were abusive to me. You're right, it wasn't. That was the result of sin. But how we responded to what they did to us, we are responsible for. Even if we were young. You see, how we respond, and a lot of times children They don't have enough understanding to respond, so the response is not a response of godliness, but a response of sinfulness, because that's human nature until we surrender our hearts to Jesus. That's why victimization of a child is such a horrendous thing. 
But when we grow up and as we grow up and become older, we have to realize that if we have chosen to hate, if we have chosen to resent, if we have chosen to hold on to unforgiveness and bitterness, if we have chosen to justify our sinful behaviors in life because of what somebody else did to us, then we have responsibility to face. For some, there's more than others. But we all have responsibility how we face what's been done to us in our lives in victimization. In any area, failed marriage, failed friendship, failed family situation. Victimization is horrible. Nobody asked for it. That's why we're victims. But how we respond as a victim is everything. And God has given us, and Jesus experienced himself the worst victimization so he could identify with us. And so many people, we have justified our sinful choices in life by the victimization or experiences or situations of our life that we have never been able to get over our sin because we're still holding it as part of our being victims. 1 John 1, 9 says, But if we confess our sins to him, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all, um, from all wickedness. Because you see, in the confession of our sins, the, in, in the accepting of our responsibility, we're enabling Christ to come in and change our choices, our behavior, how we view things so that way he can make them right. Then we have to ask ourselves, do I want to be healed? Do I want to be healed? You know, some people thrive off the negative attention that their pain has brought them. In fact, for many, it becomes a security blanket. It becomes a crutch to lean on. In fact, there are some people that they have, their identity is based on how they were victimized in their life. That's one of the situations going on in the LGBTQ community. A lot of their situation is based on the abuse in their life, and they have now created this whole identity around that from a peer group that's accepted them, and they live in that, and they've hold on to it, and they can't, this can't be wrong, this can't be wrong, because they're finding security in that. There was a woman in a church, a church I first pastored years and years and years ago, and she was at that point in her maybe late 60s, early 70s, and she had lost her husband, and one of her sons had died. And she got bitter at God. And her whole life, she was that person in church who, when you went to shake her hand, looked, you thought she was going to bite you. She was that person. She was never happy. I never, ever saw her smile in multiple years. I never saw. She thrived on the bitterness that she had from those experiences in her life. It defined her. But rather than letting God heal that, she let it continue to define her and to hold her in that place of bondage because it had become a security blanket for her. You know, Jesus went one day to the pool of Bethesda, and you had all these people who were crippled and maimed all laying around the pool, and the, the, the legend was when the, when the water stirred, that an angel would come and stir the waters, that the first one into the pool would be healed of their disease. And how many people... What a horrible sight to think of the lame, the crippled, the maimed, the sick trying to hobble down first to the pool. To get there, to get in first so they could receive their healing. How many had given up and just laid there instead and never even attempted? Well, not today. I don't feel the strength to do it. But when Jesus came up to the man at the pool, he asked him this question. He said, when Jesus saw him and knew he had been ill for a long time, he asked him, would you like to get well? And the same thing goes into our emotional place in our life. Would we like to get well? Are we so tired of trying? Are we so tired of the pain that we just have given up and we don't care about Jesus making well? Because you know what? When you begin to face the problem, when you begin to face the situation, when you begin to accept your responsibility because you've chosen to get well, that means you're going to probably choose to walk through some pain to get to the other side. But remember, Jesus is there to help you get on the other side. Amen? The fourth thing in the process of repair is that we have to choose to forgive everyone involved. Sometimes that's one person. Sometimes that's 100 people. There are sometimes we've been in situations with large groups of people and a lot of damage and a lot of gossip and a lot of painful emotion. But we have to choose to forgive everybody involved. If we don't forgive we block the sense of forgiveness of Christ, and we'll talk about that when we talk about debt collecting. But Matthew 6, 12 says, and forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. No healing can begin 
without forgiving those who have hurt us. But they don't deserve it. You're right. And we didn't deserve Jesus to forgive us either. And that's what it all comes down to. The person who hurt you in your life, the person who caused you pain in your life, the person who created the pain that you have carried year after year after year, they don't deserve forgiveness. But when we are the people of God, when we are Christians, when we have received the forgiveness of Christ in our lives, we have to extend forgiveness as Christ extended forgiveness to us when it's not deserved. And in that forgiveness is when we release the power of God to bring healing. The fifth thing is to forgive ourselves. Forgive ourselves for choices we made afterwards. Forgive ourselves for the responsibility we had. Whether that responsibility created the victimization, whether that responsibility came after it, a lot of times we walk around unwilling to forgive ourselves, unwilling to let go. We come to Jesus and we ask for his forgiveness at an altar and then we walk away still angry at ourselves. But if Jesus can remove our sins as far as the east is from the west, as Psalm 103.12 tells us, he has removed our sins as far as the east is from the west. We also looked a few weeks ago at another scripture that said that he buries them in the sea. Corey Ten Boom said, and then he puts up a sign saying, no fishing. Corey Ten Boom was that lady who was in the Holocaust that hid Jews. And because of her hiding Jews to protect their lives, was sent to concentration camps and watched her sister die in the concentration camps and watched the abuse of the Nazis. You want to talk about abuse. She had to learn to forgive those who had abused her in such depths and great ways. But she also understood about forgiving ourselves. Self-righteous guilt is destructive. And when we are not willing to forgive ourselves and forgive ourselves for the part that we might have played in something, or the, the way we responded, or the way we interacted, or however it might have been, then we are just as guilty as not forgiving other people. Because you are a person who needs to be forgiven too. And the sixth thing is to ask the Spirit what the real problem is and how to pray. In James it tells us, you ask and do not receive because you ask and miss. That you may spend it on your pleasures. The reality is God wants us to ask his spirit how to walk us through the process of healing in our lives. And if we would allow the spirit of God to take us through that process, we can't try and say, we can't control how the spirit wants to bring the healing. We can't control what he's, God, I'll forgive this person, but I won't forgive that person. Mm, the Holy Spirit's going to say, forgive everybody. We can't control, we want to stay in such control that, that we're not allowing, that we'll pray and our prayers are, are, are shaped by our perspective. That's why we have to let go of our perspective and say, Holy Spirit, you guide me to what I need to do in this process and I will respond and obey. This is why people have come to Jesus but never have been fully healed by Jesus because we're still controlling the process and it's a part of yielding ourselves so God can do the work he wants to do in our lives. I know that God can bring great healing into everybody's life. We've all been on a journey. We've all been through places of pain. We all need the salve of the Holy Spirit to minister into our lives. And God wants to dig out the emotional cancer that's been in our lives. He might make, it, he might make that scar in your life as a part of your history as a great tree. But he wants to heal it over. You know, sometimes when trees grow and they have those deep crevices... And in them, and those deep notches in them, those are areas where the tree could not heal itself. God wants to heal us. And he wants to allow his spirit to heal us. And he wants to bring us to places of emotional health in him. Because when we're emotionally healthy, we can minister emotionally healthy to other people. And we can minister and help others in their need. Because God wants us to bring us to that place. And I know that God wants to do a work. So I'm going to ask you to bow your heads. I'm going to ask for the ushers to prepare for communion. And I'm going to ask that we would take a little bit of time of introspection as we're preparing for communion this morning. To say, God, what do you need to do in my life? God, is there an area I've not surrendered? If you've been through this process and you've let it go to Jesus, awesome. But if you've not, if there are areas in your heart that you're still carrying that woundedness around with, with you, God wants to begin a process in your life. It's not going to just be instantaneous. It's going to be a process. 
And we're going to talk it through and we're going to look at God's word in these various areas as we come over the next several weeks. But I know that the Holy Spirit wants to help you in your weakness. So right now where you're at, I want you to surrender those weaknesses to him. I want you to begin by saying, Lord, I'm going to face the responsibility. I'm going to face the problem. And I'm going to surrender it to you, Jesus. That you can begin a work that only you can do in my life. Holy Spirit, help us, I pray. Holy Spirit, help us, I pray. Because, Lord, you want to bind up wounds. You want to bind up hurts. You want to bind up damage done by, by sinful people to each other. Lord, that was never your plan for your creation, but sin entered this world, and because of it, Lord, we've all experienced abuse and hurt and pain. We've all caused it to others as well, sometimes out of our own hurt and abuse and pain. Jesus, the healing begins here. We want your healing today. We want your healing today, Lord. We want your healing today, Jesus.